Hello everyone um, and welcome to this Policy Press webinar on creativity in research. I'm Philippa Grand, publisher for Research Methods and Practices at Policy Press, and I'm delighted that today we're going to be discussing this fascinating topic, exploring how the pandemic has enabled and inspired creative approaches in research and how a broader creative turn has facilitated this. I like to think that Policy Press has played a small role in this turn to creativity. In 2015, we published Helen Cara's best-selling textbook, Creative Research Methods in the Social Sciences, now in its second edition. And we are publishing uh, next month, Creative Research Methods in Education, co-authored um, uh, along with others by Helen and Dawn Manet. Our speakers today will talk for about 10 minutes each. And after that, our chair, Helen Cara, will, uh, will put your questions to the panel. So please use the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen for your questions. Sadly, Dudu has been unable to, um, to, to make the uh, webinar today. If you have any technical issues, please use the chat function. Uh, and we will also shortly post a 50% discount code for Helen and Dawn's books in the chat section too. Um, the webinar is just to let you know that the webinar is also being recorded today. So without further ado, I'm now going to hand over to Helen to start the session. Hello, everyone. It's lovely to see so many of you here, although, of course, I can't see you, but I can see a number and it's a good number. So thank you for joining us. I'm going to share my screen right now, which always just takes a few seconds and makes Zoom go a bit strange. Um, but we will sort that out. So. Um, yeah, some of the books that were mentioned, let's not dwell on those. The reason I've been asked to share this webinar is because really of these ebooks that we produced in October. I wrote a blog post last May about methods people might consider using in a pandemic. And my editor, Philippa Grant, who just introduced this webinar to you, read my book and emailed me and said, would you like to edit a book for us? And I thought, yeah, okay recruited a co-editor. We thought we might get 15 good chapters if we were lucky. Even though there was a really short lead time for uh, people to submit chapter proposals, we actually got over 100 proposals and most of them were good ones. So we ended up with three ebooks, and they have different subtitles. The subtitle for volume three is involves creativity, but actually creativity runs through all of these volumes. And it was fascinating for us to see how creative researchers were and are being during the pandemic in the way that they were adapting methods, devising new methods, mixing methods together in ways that hadn't been done before to meet the needs of their research projects. So I'm just going to whisk through a few of those, um, but just briefly to say that clearly this is fairly obvious, you know, some methods you can't, if you can't, if you're in lockdown, you can't do face-to-face -face focus groups. Um, maybe you can do them online instead. But maybe you need a whole new method. And this whole situation has really encouraged researchers to be more creative. And I'm delighted that we have Ali Roy and Dawn Mane with us who are going to give you fuller examples of their own work in this context. So five examples I'm going to give you from the ebooks. Virginia Braun and Naomi Clark um, from the UK and New Zealand used a method called story completion. They were looking at People's, the sense people were making out of lockdown restrictions and compliance with or not compliance with, they didn't want to ask people direct questions. They thought it would be put people in a difficult position. So they decided to use fiction. This is a technique that's been used for a long time, um, but not in this kind of way and not in this kind of context. So they made up six little, what they called story stems. So that might, it's just a few sentences, the start of a story, maybe about um, a young lad whose friends asked him to go to the park for drinks when he wasn't supposed to. And then they asked people to complete these as fictional stories, focusing on the decisions the characters made and the consequences of those decisions. Um, and they got loads of really good data. I think three participants only wrote one. They got 285. And it was really rich, really detailed, really useful information. Another one, this is a doctoral student in the UK, and she became interested in her Instagram feed um, and the increase in people crafting, making, creating things 
as a response to the first lockdown in the UK. So she joined in with her supervisor and decided to study this. Um, and she, as, she did, as she'd observed it on social media, she used social media to recruit participants. And she asked them to keep diaries of their making, just brief structured diaries, um, and take photos and show the, her photos of what they've made. And then talk about that in an online interview. Um, and they, she offered a whole range of options for diaries. Um, not just the standard written thing, but also audio if people wanted to, or video or textile stitch diary. If you haven't seen a stitch diary, Claire Danek has a really good um, example online. And she found that one really important thing, she's like this naturally, but when people sent in stuff, she sent a response. She didn't just think, oh, so there's some data coming in, jolly good. She, she looked at it, thought about it, and sent them a considered response saying how she'd thought their use of colour was lovely or she was really interested in the way they put something together and found that participants really valued that in lockdown, that human contact from a researcher. And that itself is a creative approach. Louise Cusero, another doctoral student. Now, this is actually her doctoral study. She was all ready to go. Um, she was looking at uh, children, I think, aged 11 to 14 in their responses to these quite new biographical books about women like Goodnight Stories for Rebel Girls. And she was going to do stuff in groups with them in person, but then the pandemic hit. So she devised this thing she's called a reader response toolkit. And it's based on the design research principle of cultural probes, where you offer a menu of different activities and people can participate in whichever ones they like. They don't have to do them all. They can just do one or two if they like. And she made it all digital. She sent out packs, physical packs to people. Um, but all the activities could be done or presented online, you know, you know, through photographs, through showing, didn't have to all be done online. And the point of this is to make it fun for participants and for the researcher. Um, and then she conducted online interviews and looked at what people had made and all their photos of what they'd made, depending what it was, and did a bit of reading with them on Zoom as well. And that all worked really well. When we published the books, she devised the method, but she hadn't had time to test it because we got the books done so fast. So I checked in with her on Twitter um, and said, you know, how's it going? And she said she's had some really amazing responses, cakes, hand puppets, poems, all sorts of stuff. She's going to have fun analysing all of that lot, but she's certainly having a good time gathering the data. Then this is different. This is a longitudinal piece of work on gender and oh, I can't even remember what it stands for. It's in the Middle East and North Africa. It's to do with gender and adolescent experience. And this is a project that had been running for five years um, and was still running. Uh, but of course, the researchers couldn't. It was mostly based in Jordan, Lebanon and Palestine. And not all of the researchers were in those countries. Those that were not in the countries couldn't travel to the countries. And those that were in those countries couldn't travel around and people couldn't meet. So they moved to digital storytelling, which is a, something you can do online. They used photos and diaries to get young people to tell their stories online. And it could be written diaries or audio diaries. Uh, so quite a flexible approach. This is another thing we're seeing a lot of need for during the pandemic. Um, they structured the diaries a little bit to make it easier for people. And they found it helpful because they had the existing relationships with participants. It wasn't necessarily something they would do straight off with new participants, but because they already knew their participants, this worked quite well. Then some work in uh, Sao Paulo in Brazil. This is again, another long-term piece of work with waste pickers who are highly marginalized um, people in, this, in the society of the city, often homeless, don't have much money, uh, but they do have a sort of community place where the research was based, but then in lockdown that had to close and the researchers couldn't contact their participants. In fact, they got funding to buy smartphones to give to participants, but they couldn't figure out how to do that safely, how to even get hold of them to say, we've got a smartphone to give you. You're right, thank you. I'm talking too fast because I'm aware of time. Um, couldn't find them to, you know, couldn't get contact them. So they just couldn't continue the way they were doing. But they turned to secondary data. And this was a real plus. They were able to go back because it's a long term project. They they reanalyzed previous data. They looked online for records and videos. They reanalyzed stuff on the Facebook page for this group and so on. And that was really helpful. So that 
is a whistle stop. We're not going to stop for questions. We're going to have questions at the end. So I will stop sharing and um, Ali and Dawn talk slower than me because I've gone too fast. Um, I will stop sharing and hand you over to Alistair Roy, who is going to tell you about his work, his creative work uh, in research. And please do remember to put questions in the Q&A, not in the chat. Thank you. Just going to unmute myself. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, good, good. All right. Uh, well, my name's Ali Roy, and uh, if anybody does that Twitter stuff, then I'm Ali Roy one and I'd be delighted to hear any comments or responses to um, anything that I've got to say. I want to start my presentation with an idea that I borrowed from a book that I both love and find deeply annoying. Um, it's this book by David Silverman, a very short, fairly interesting, reasonably cheap book about qualitative research. I love this book because it's not a how-do type of book, but rather it engages with a load of really interesting questions about habits, habitus, finding and manufacturing data, and questions of what we do with the data that we generate in our research. I find it deeply annoying because he's incredibly disparaging about the work of some people who I think are quite brilliant. And uh, in, in some ways he's quite disparaging about creative approaches to research. But he starts in the first chapter with this rather brilliant story about the uh, singer songwriter, Sammy Khan from uh, the US in the 1940s, who was once asked this question in an interview. When you write a song, what comes first, the words or the music? And Khan replies, no, not the words or the music. First comes the phone call. Now, Silverman's point is that Khan's joke has a serious significance because it, can, it shows that our concern for the experience of creative artists neglects a central issue. And that central issue is how artistic products are located in the everyday organization and realities of artistic practice. And in Khan's case, that reality is that new songs often arise from commissions. Now, Tim Ingold makes this rather nice point, I think, about creativity that, that links to this point about Silverman. And he says that some people have this peculiar idea about creativity. They think that it's a sort of unknown X factor that is located somewhere in the mind brain that accounts for the spontaneous generation of absolutely new ideas. And what both Silverman and Ingold draw our attention to is the idea that as research practitioners, our innovations emerge from adaptation and improvisation as we negotiate our passage through the array of tasks, contexts, situations and problems which arise in the context of doing our research and I guess that's why questions of what happens in a pandemic have been so interesting and it also suggests that the sort of um, two things first that the wellsprings of creativity lie not inside people's heads but in their capacity to attend to the world in formation and secondly, that doing creativity and research is not about how much we know, but how well we understand and can respond with subtlety and nuance to the context in which we work and the changing context in which we work. So the story that I wanna tell in this presentation is one of adaptation, because it's a, pro it's a story about a project that I've been working with on and off for about six years, which is Left Coast, which is which was started as a response to Arts Council England's Creative People and Places programme. Um, and uh, I've been working with them on and off for many years. And in 2019, they started this project called Real Estate, which was uh, funded by the Big Lottery Foundation. And the premise of the project is that two socially engaged artists live in houses in particular areas of Blackpool and Fleetwood. So they live as residents uh, for a period of uh, 12 months at a time 
And their role or their job is to try to seek to understand issues which contribute to people's sense of isolation and loneliness in these areas, and to try and generate artistic proposals and projects which respond to those situations and allow people to initiate changes in their own lives and their, in their own communities. So for many reasons, this has been a very interesting project to be doing in the context of the pandemic. But the first year of the project was before the pandemic. And in that year we did, we largely used ethnographic methods. So I'd go to Blackpool for two or three days at a time. I'd have detailed conversations with the artists. We'd tap into things that they were doing in the area. And we'd have lots of conversations with local people um, off the back of those contacts. And, you know, that was a great way of molding informality and formality in, an, in a nice way and it's approach we've used really successfully for many years but for all the reasons that we're all familiar with this time last year that proved to be an impossible way to carry on in the second year but also interestingly most of what the artists had proposed to do in that year also proved to be impossible so they were adapting their programs of work and actually the artists that we were starting to develop relationships with are ones who started their year of work about six weeks before the pandemic. So what did we do? Well, as I've described, the project looked very public, like this image that you see in the photo in the first year, lots of events of this sort. And in the second year, some of it went online. It was much more about one-to-one -one contacts with people, distant conversations, creative activities that could be sent out in the post, the development of a scrub hub, lots of things that responded to the pandemic. But we were in a situation of trying to work with artists who we didn't know and couldn't meet. So this is what we did. We started by meeting weekly on Teams. And you know, later on, we relaxed that to bi-weekly or monthly meetings. And we started these meetings with sort of icebreaker stuff. So I'll tell you the one minute story of how I became an academic. And you'll tell me the one minute story of how you became a, a socially engaged artist. Um, and another one we used was tell me about something that you keep on your desk and, uh, and why it's there, an object of importance that you keep on your desk and why it's there. Stuff like this, just to kind of get the conversation going. And over time, we started to have much more detailed conversations about the work. But we asked the artists to use visual and written diaries, which they did really beautifully. And we asked them to send us these diaries on a weekly basis. And this allowed us to keep really close to the things that they were doing on the ground and to have a sense of the problems that, was em that were emerging in the work. And every week we would send back questions, reflections, thoughts, associations in response to the diaries as a way of maintaining a research conversation in between the Teams meetings. And we also asked for permission to drop into online spaces that they were hosting as and where it felt appropriate to them and the people that they were working with. So by meeting regularly online, we were able to maintain a rapport and stay close to the work. And the diary stuff worked really well because they did it so beautifully. Um, and although it felt very strange to start off the work online, we did get used to it. And I think that reflects something that we all now know that um, online spaces can be better at sustaining relationships than getting them going in the first place. But you know, there can be ways around that. Towards the end of the year, we really wanted to do some interviews with people who'd taken part in some of the creative activities that the artists had generated in the year. And this year, a lot of them were older residents who happened to live close by the artists' houses. And this was a bit of work we had to give quite a lot of thought to. Uh, and so we, in the end, we offered people four ways to do this. The first was an email exchange. The second was a WhatsApp exchange because they had WhatsApp groups going. Uh, the third was a Teams or Zoom interview, and the fourth was a telephone interview. And what was interesting was that the vast majority of people chose a telephone interview. Um, and we used a lot of narrative, open type questions, and we used a lot of reference to the work that they've been doing with the artists in the course of the year. And funnily enough, I've noticed that I have a real preference for doing telephone interviews over Teams or Zoom interviews. It seems counterintuitive, but in a way, I also recognize that I like doing interviews 
on the move where you're side by side rather than face to face. And I quite like putting my headphones on, putting my hood up and just getting into the bubble of the conversation. So, you know, those are just a few examples from one project uh, about how we've adapted to this situation. And I've got three takeaways. The first is that maybe in lots of respects, creativity has more to do with adaptation and attending to the world around us than sparks of mental genius. The second is that we need to continue to mind the relationships and adapt as we go and accept that technology can really help, but that not every research problem has a ready-made technological solution. And thirdly, when we're using technologies, we need to understand, tap into, respect and utilize the technologies people feel comfortable with and preferably ones that they already use in their day-to-day -day lives. That's all. Thanks for listening. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and I'll go silent. Thanks, Ali. That was lovely. That was really interesting. And now, before we get to the questions, questions are starting to come into the Q&A. Um, so feel free to add yours if you want to. But before we get to the questions, we're going to hear from Dawn. You're muted, Dawn. You need to unmute. There you go. So, um, Fernanda, good afternoon, everyone um, from Wales. I'm from Wales. You're from all over the place. And thank you very much for inviting me to talk today. So I'm going to just think about how the pandemic has had an impact on my work. I think, oh, sorry. I've just got an issue now with that. I may keep them in this view because I'm having a little bit of an issue with the computer. So I'll keep them here and then you've got an idea of what's coming next. So you can, you can see what the next slide will be. So, pre-pandemic, I use a lot of creative methods in face-to-face -face situations. So I'd go to people's houses and they'd bring objects. People would draw. I'd use sandboxing when you use lots of little figures in a sandbox, collaging. So lots and lots of creative methods, but usually the participants making these in their own homes and me then meeting them face-to-face -face, or me making the things with the participants and me making representations about aspects of my life and then making representations about aspects of their lives. So that's how I worked before the pandemic, mostly face to face, mostly with people, mostly hands on in creating data, but also um, in dissemination. So I feel quite strongly that there are not only benefits from working creatively in terms of field work, but also get any message out because when you do a project and you do the lit review, you realize that lots and lots of people have done really good research in this area, but nothing's changing in policy or practice of everyday life. So I've also done a lot of revisualization work when I've made posters and cartoons and films with participants to get those messages out. So when the pandemic did come along, I was thinking, how can this work? So I've got all these lovely projects planned when I'm meeting people and we're gonna make things together and have all these lovely workshops. And now I can't see anyone, now I'm constrained. So there were delays and postponements with some projects and there are still delays and postponements with some of them. But with some projects, we were able to make changes and I was very cynical at the beginning that this would work. And I was very concerned also about digital access because a lot of the people that I work with may not have money to have Wi-Fi continually or use their phone credit. But we were actually able to build some solutions and I was surprised by how well the projects went. So this project um, with Louise Roberts and colleagues 
We were really interested on how the pandemic impacted on young people who were coming out of the care system. So young people had been in foster care or in residential care, they were just leaving care and we've gone into lockdown. So how did it impact on their lives? So we just made it really open because everyone's in difficult circumstances. So we said, you can take photographs, you can draw, you can write poetry, you can have an email conversation with us, you can have a postal conversation with us, we can phone you, we can Zoom, we can Skype, we can WhatsApp. We'll do whatever works for you. So we had lots of different responses, but some people responded creatively. So this model here, you can see, is being built by a young person. I think it really powerfully communicates the ways in which the COVID pandemic overshadowed their home, overshadowed their town, cast this sort of dark shadow over everybody's life. So you've got this deserted town and this shadow of COVID. Other people responded by writing poems. So this is a poem from one young person. And they say, times have changed, time is passing, but our need for your care is not lapsing. We may whinge and shout and say we don't want, but we do, we really want you to. We're isolated, changed, really not sure. We need the face, the one we say we dislike. We need those texts we never reply to. We need the language that you share, they, hey, how you doing? I'm still here. This is the real language that cares, the language we need, the language which shows us not everything has changed, the language that comforts us like a weird ant would send, which would make you cringe and smile, the smile which means something hasn't changed, the language you use to show us you care. So lots of young people sort of talked about three COVID, you know, the social workers come, they just get on their nerves, they don't want them texting, phoning, turning up. But in COVID, you really need that communication. And that's what a lot of young people were missing. They were missing communication, physical contact. So those were the things that they really missed. And poetry was a really nice way to get across that depth of feeling. So that was that project. The other project that I've been working on, which is now going into phase two, was with children in foster care. So we've done lots of work before with children in foster care, and this was very much about how they can direct research and how they think questions should be asked and what activities they'd like to do. And traditionally, we've done this in whole day activities. So we've had children come and we've done rock climbing and sports and bag making and t-shirt making. We've had like a whole day of fun and lunch and dinner and activities. So that wasn't going to happen. So we had to do it remotely. So we had to send different packs by post. We couldn't be involved in the making activities because we were in different houses. So we relied a lot on foster carers, which was sort of opposite to how we planned the project. So we planned to work with children without their foster carers and for it to be directed very much by children. And foster carers then ended up becoming very involved. And then when things were made, so here you've got painted stones, we had painted stones. We had a water bottle and then children wrote a message in a bottle that they'd send to somebody else to tell them about themselves, which went really well, except um, when child got so excited to use the water bottle that they put a drink in with their message. But these were useful because at the time, because of COVID, children had to take water bottles to school and they could personalize these and write their names on them. So they did all these activities and then we did interviews, um, mostly on Zoom because people said they preferred that. And they told us about what they'd made, what it means, what they thought worked, what they thought didn't work. And then they've been involved as a design team for the next project, suggesting different activities, different things to make, different topics to talk about. So even though there were barriers, in a way, it was really useful because we had these unexpected outcomes that challenged our assumptions. So we thought we were going to work with the children without the foster carers. What we found was that it was really, really useful, particularly in COVID, for foster carers to do these activities with the children. And they said they learned lots of things about the children. The children learned new things about the foster carers. 
And now a lot of foster carers have said they'd like to have this sort of creativity pack every time they work with a new child. So when a new child goes to live with them, you do all these activities together in a creative way and learn about each other in a way that's non-threatening. So where we would have excluded foster carers if we set up in the usual way, we wouldn't have had this unexpected outcome. And we wouldn't have had this new learning. Also in the other study, I thought the telephone interviews would you wouldn't be able to engage people, but people were very engaged and very relaxed. So where before we might have been meeting in a neutral venue or going to see them, they were in their own home and their own space and more comfortable. So as much as the old way I thought was great in the best way, when you make adaptions, you can actually learn to be creative in a very different way and also learn that it's not impossible. And we don't have to have a sort of screaming face. We just need to be more open to the challenges and work forward with new ways of thinking and doing. Okay, so I'm going to stop share. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dawn. That was equally wonderful. And I'm sure you can, you'll just have to imagine the roars of applause, both of you. Um, and uh, thanks very much. We've got a bunch of questions. I'm going to try and get through as many as we can in the remaining nearly half an hour. The first one is specifically for Ali um, from Joe Mabin, who says, it sounds like great data, but I wondered how that blend of methods was experienced by the artists. Was there any risk that it was very intensively evaluative for them? Yeah, it's a brilliant question. Um, I, I noticed that one and I started um, typing a response and I just thought I couldn't do it and listen to Dawn well at the same time. So um, uh, yeah, I think it's a really good question. And, um, you know, what it didn't explain is that um, in this program, in the Left Coast program, there are producers as well. And obviously the role of the producer, you know, is to kind of is to support the artists uh, and the creative process of the artists. And actually what we decided as a team was to do those meetings together so that the creative conversations about the work were foregrounded you know, in those weekly um, conversations. And we could fold into that things that we needed to know as evaluators. So in that respect, the conversations that we had on a regular basis and we negotiated, um, you know, the regularity of those became a part of the work rather than a sort of separate bit, you know, for the evaluation. Um, and the diaries, the visual diaries uh, and, and written diaries were also part of that, um, you know, that work for them, you know, they were working around a sort of theory of change, uh, you know, a, approach and, and that. So, so, so in a way, we folded together those different bits of the work so that we were able to have these creative conversations along the way, rather than dropping in as sort of, you know, separate evaluators at, you know, particular points in time. So it seemed to work okay in, in, in that respect, but I think it's a great question. Thank you. And thank you from our questioner too in the chat. Then we've got actually almost the same question twice. So I'm going to give you both these questions. Angela Gregory says, there seems to be limited understanding and possibly some belittling of the value that creative methods can offer research. What is your response if challenged about using creative methods? And then we have an anonymous question, very similar lines. I often grapple with the need to provide justification for the funding for creative research. Granting agencies require impact and significance. As a researcher who is not an artist and who is not researching art, but uses storytelling as an arts-based method, I find it hard. Any advice? Do you, do you want to go first, Dawn, or do you want me to go first? I don't mind. I don't mind. I go, go on, Dawn. Now, Ali answered the last one. You go first. <laughs> so... I think it's much I think it's much easier than it used to be and I think that funders have a much better understanding. There is an emphasis on impact but you can creativity in, engenders impact so I've got a for the next ref now I've got an impact case study and all, all of the work in it has used creative methods. I think there's an argument for using creative methods to generate different ways of understanding that you might do using a standard interview. I think there's an argument about fighting familiarity and 
giving the chance for participants to be more reflexive about their lives. So if you go in with set interview questions, the researchers design those and they can constrain the participants. If you go in with a more open activity, you can argue that this offers opportunities to generate new data that comes from the perspective of participants. There's a lot of emphasis on co-production and co-design. It's really good if you can get a, a steering group of that, the community that you're researching with to guide the process. So there's a lot more emphasis on that now. So I think there is a lot more emphasis, even across disciplines um, where you might not have seen it before. So when I first had a sandbox with sand and hundreds of little figures, a lot of um, sort of colleagues and people were saying, oh, what's she doing? The mad, the mad woman with her bag of creative stuff. Now, at least um, five other research centres have got sandboxes and they've had to email to ask, where do you buy them from? So I think there is a turn. I think it's just, you just need to frame it. But I think if you look at the literature, you can, you can frame it like that because there's lots of good justifications. Um, am I all right to make a quick response to that too? Yes, okay. please do. Um, one of the stories that I love, um, I, I, well, okay, so, Kind of impact change, um, you know, policy change. Um, I, I, I love that idea that the only thing um, that uh, has more impact than a double blind randomized controlled trial is a single story. Um, you know, the process of policy change relies on stories too. Um, and I think Dawn's right to say that, you know, the, the landscape is shifting. I think you have to know your funder. Um, and I think whatever methods you're using, you know, or whatever methodology and overall framework you're proposing, you need to defend it. Um, uh, but actually, you know, if what you're interested in is the everyday lived and live, lives and lived realities, you know, of young people living in residential care for the sake of argument, then there is a very strong case for framing an approach which allows you to get alongside those young people um, and you know, to, to stage a conversation, um, you know, which is why I think, you know, I did, I mean, there's lovely stuff written by people like Harry Ferguson about the car as a site of social work. When I was a residential social worker, the best conversations I ever had with kids were sat side by side in the car, not face to face. So there is something about the third space that uh, creative activity creates that allows a conversation to unfold in a more natural way. So I think in the end, you're right, there is resistance, there is traditionality, um, you know, in some places, but the landscape is shifting. Um, and I think whatever approach you propose, and I don't mind using very traditional approaches either, um, you have to defend your choices. And just to add a tiny two pennies to that, I think um, all of those points were really good and really valid. And certainly you can you can really build a case from the literature now because all three of us have written and published stuff that you can that's proper academic and you can cite it. And we're not we're not the only ones by any means. Um, but I think also it's it's heartening to see how much even STEM scholars are now using creative methods. Yeah. It's not just about the arts and the social sciences and the humanities anymore. Um, so that's that's you know this is a revolution. We're all in the revolution, but it's happening and it's great. So there's another question that I'd like to pose to both of you from Anna Francis Douglas, um, asking about analysis. What new methods of analysis are afforded by these new creative process methods? I think that's a really interesting question. Who wants to kick off on that one? Um, I can go first if you like. I mean, I think, again, it, it depends on the data, um, you know, doesn't it? And, you know, if, if you're... Um, you know, if you're producing visual data, you know, so, I mean, you know, to give a live example, I have a PhD student at the minute who's um, doing a really interesting project uh, with young men selling sex uh, in which she's using uh, walking tour interviews and map making. Um, and so the big wrestle is, um, you know, it, this isn't just like normal narrative data, you know, where if you use something like the biographical narrative uh, interpretive method, somebody tells a story with a beginning and a middle and the end, because the stories that people tell in a walking interview also attach to places. 
um, and also the ways in which people draw the maps uh, are incredibly idiosyncratic. In fact, the ways in which people can you know, conceive the idea of a map. So some of them are incredibly cartographic, some of them are quite list-like. So, you know, I think you're right to register the fact that it's all very well producing, um, you know, uh, creative data, but it does generate problems about how you analyze that. Um, and, and I think, again, you've got to, de you, you've got to de develop and you've got to think about why you're using those approaches. So are you using them to generate narratives, for example? You know, are you using them uh, to, to phase a conversation? Uh, and I think that's part of your defense. Part of your defense is saying, well, OK, in relation to these data, you know, this is the approach that we're, we're going to use. Uh, and for us, it's quite often sort of panel analysis as well. So drawing teams of people together to discuss the work along the way. Yeah, sometimes, um, sometimes the data that we generate with participants is more of an elicitation tool. So sometimes things that get created and made, so collages or sandboxing or drawings or object work, and it's less about what's created, but it's around the talk. So the data is the talk around what's created rather than the data itself. Where I do look at the visual, sometimes I look at contradictions between what's made and what's said, things that get left out of what's made, which then I would follow up with further questions when things are absent. I would be more likely to use traditional um, visual tools of analysis with found images. So images on the internet, images on magazine covers. We did a project before when we worked with um, young parents and we looked on um, Google, and we did searches and put mother and baby, where you get lots of idealized images. And then we put young mother, you get lots of stigmatized images. So then we use social representations theory and semiotics to analyze the images themselves. So the sort of standard tropes around smoking and graffiti and these sort of stigmatized visual tropes, but also things like measurements between mother and child to think about what's the difference. So we did that process and then we took the photographs back to groups of mothers to think about how they conceptualize these different images. So I think there's lots of creative ways to analyze visual data, but you don't always need to focus the analysis on the visual data. Sometimes it can be on the talk around that data. Great, okay, thank you. Um, another question, which I think is a really interesting one from Barbara Spicer. Does the panel think that post pandemic there will be a shift not only to more creative research practices, but also more ethical ones that move from do no harm to actively caring about our participants and ourselves? There's that nods. Would, <laughs> that would be great, wouldn't it? I mean, I think a lot of people are already working in that way. So I've been um, doing interviews today for um, ESRC PhD students. I've got interviews all week. And students are coming in saying that they, they don't just want to do research for research sake. They want to do research for positive changes and for positive changes in the communities that they're working with. So they want to see more care. So I think there's, I think there's a shift anyway to that. I think, I think it's expanded our thinking. They're doing things in different ways. I think for us on our projects, I'm much more open now about people who are saying, you know, we don't want to speak, we'll just email or we'll do it this totally different way. The totally different way doesn't seem so different because we've had to work in totally different ways. And I think we'll be better at adapting and supporting people with those adaptions rather than having this idea that we have to do things in a particular way. So I think that's really useful to be more, we were flexible before, but I think we'll be more flexible. Looking after ourselves would be amazing. I'm waiting for Ali to give me the answer about how to best look after myself. That would be nice. Yeah, well, I think uh, learning to look after ourselves, um, yeah, that's a lifelong um, job there. I haven't got any um, magic responses uh, to, to, to that. Um, I think it's a really interesting question. It's certainly a very live one in terms of how we teach ethics. Um, and how we manage ethics. Um, the Centre for, for Professional Ethics, uh, headed up by Doris Schroeder at UCLan, is doing a, a piece of work around this at the minute. Um, 
And I think it's a really important uh, issue, um, for, certainly for universities, about processes of ethical approval um, as well, you know, uh, that um, can support, you know, working in different ways um, and, and the ways in which kind of harm is under, you know, is, is sort of understood and misunderstood uh, as well. So I think it's a big question. Um, you know, I think that's probably a slightly flaky answer, um, but, uh, you know, more for us to think about too. Oh, I don't think I'd describe it as flaky. Um, there are a couple of things that came through strongly from the ebooks for them from the proposals we got. Um, and one is that in the pandemic, everyone is vulnerable. The concept, the sort of rather paternalistic concept that research ethics committees or researchers can decide who is and who is not vulnerable is losing traction rapidly. And I'm very happy to see it go uh, because I think participants often have a much better idea about the risks of taking part in research than researchers do about, you know, about their own risks. Um, and also when you're in a pandem global pandemic where we're all at risk of illness, of bereavement, of anxiety about close friends and relatives who, are, who may be sick or may get sick and all of this kind of thing, we are really all vulnerable. There is no justification whatsoever for any of us standing in judgment over others' levels of vulnerability. I don't think there ever was actually, but there really isn't now. And another thing that came through strongly is that people are much more seriously asking the question, should we do this research? Actually, should, is, this, is it ethical for us to do this research right now or to continue doing our research? Should we stop? Should we pause? Should we just stop? Should we not start? Um, and these are questions that were not addressed. And I think Ali's point about research ethics committees having a rethink, that's something that, to my knowledge, has only come under the purview of one research ethics committee in the world, which is the New Zealand Ethics Committee. Very interesting committee if you want to check it out. It's a bit of a maverick, independent committee. It doesn't belong to an institution. And that committee concerns itself with how ethical a, a research question is to start with, how ethical is it to to do a project. I don't know any other ethics committee that does that, but I think they all should. I think they all should. Um, you know, as researchers, I think as soon as we've formulated a potential research question, the next question we should be asking ourselves is, is this ethical? Could our findings be misused? Are we going down a dodgy track here? Um, anyway, so that's just a couple of points that I would add uh, to what you were saying. Now, let me have a look at the Q&A. We've got some quite specific Oh, now this was interesting, this is an interesting one, from Bryn greer Wooten. To what extent is this type of research COVID driven rather than being creative in itself? I think there's some assumptions in that question you might want to unpack, or you can answer it a completely different way if you like. Over to you. Well, I suppose, I suppose it depends which research you mean. I mean, if it was the research that I was talking about in my presentation, then it definitely wasn't COVID driven because it started a year before COVID, but it's definitely been COVID affected. But uh, I think for me, it registers um, a really interesting point that most academics I know have spent most of the last 12 months writing bids. Um, you know, that COVID has certainly generated a flurry of research ideas. And so I think that question of, um, you know, for me, registers the point that Helen was you know, discussing in the last response uh, about it, it's really important to, you know, um, to, to register whether all this research, you know, needs doing, um, you know, at this particular moment in time. Yeah, and I can answer for mine. So I can see this whole point about COVID driven. So before I did that project, I did get invited and some people talk to me about other COVID projects that I didn't want to be involved in right at the start of COVID because I just thought I'm stressed. You know, I don't want to, I don't really feel like doing a project when it first started. This, but there has been some really, really good and important projects done in COVID, which I think are needed. The project that we did with young people was when they asked for. So we have a group of care leavers and young people in care that we've worked with for a long time who advise us on research and they've asked for research before and somebody got a postdoc and did that research on um, care leavers whose children go into care so that's something they asked for and they asked for this so none of us were really feeling like doing any research but we've been engaged with these young people for a long time and they wanted it done 
because they didn't feel that their voice was getting heard and they were getting the services that they needed. So they asked us to do this project and we worked with local authority providers in a survey and then with the young people. And they were pleased with the project and also advised. They advised all the way through. So I think, you know, that was ethical. That came from the young people that wanted it done. The other project was already, wasn't about COVID. So obviously children have talked about COVID because it's such a massive impact, but it's not a COVID project. It's just a project that coincided with COVID. So yeah, that was those two. But there are some great, I mean, like the COVID realities is a quite a nice project. They've been doing lots of creative work with families and they've got a website up. So it's probably worth looking at, at that. Yeah, I think there's, I think there's an extent I've got an echo, sorry. No, it's gone. There's an extent to which the pandemic conditions drive creativity and research. And we saw that coming through really strongly um, in the eBooks, in the submissions for the eBooks, that researchers were really trying to think further, think differently about how to work with, how to support their participants, how to reach their participants, how to manage their data, how all of these things had to be rethought or thought about differently. And there were some, just some, it's phenomenally creative responses from all around the world. Um, so I for me, I think COVID has driven creativity in research to an extent anyway. Um, so we have an anonymous question now. How would you encourage participants who say we are not creative to engage in this type of research? Do you meet that kind of resistance? And if, if so, what do you do? How do you handle that? I love this question. When I first, when I was doing my PhD, I was so impressed by creative methods that I wanted everyone to do them. And my methods were so participatory that I thought I would force all my participants to do my participatory methods. And my PhD supervisor said, if they don't want to do it, Dawn, that's the opposite of participatory. So I had to learn a lesson about that. So if people are really unwilling to do it, just don't, don't do it. Just let them do something else. Just let them just do an interview and talk or do whatever they want to do. You can't, I mean, sometimes people don't want to try things, but you know, then they will, and that's a different thing. But if people really don't want to do it, they don't want to do it. And I don't think, I don't think you always need consistency. I don't think everyone has to do exactly the same thing in a project, because I often get asked that, you know, well, they did collage in, but they wanted to do photo elicitation and they just did an interview. You say, yeah, because that's what they wanted to do. So I think you've got to engage people on their own terms. That's that's the lesson I've learned. I, I think that's really right. And I think the idea of options um, is, is, is really good. I mean, Kath Larkins, who um, runs the Center for Children and Young People's Participation at UCLan, you know, has really nice approaches where she'll be working in a particular space. I mean, this is pre-COVID, you know, and where there'll be a series of different things that people can kind of wander between. Um, but I've got a nice story. It's not mine. Again, it's from my lovely PhD student, George Jake, who's um, doing this work with young men selling sex. And um, when he introduced this idea of map making to, um, to one of his participants, um, the, the, the fellow was pretty bemused and he was kind of like, he engaged with it in the most kind of perfunctory way and basically said, you draw the map. <laughs> I'll tell you and you draw the map. Um, and then they did this series of walking interviews. And then a few months later, he got in contact and he said, I want to do the map. <laughs> I want to do the map. And so he, he organized this meeting where this uh, fellow drew six different maps and told this story about how they related together. So I think, it, it, you know, for me, the, the moral of that story is, you know, it's an option. And, you know, and, 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 you know, a bit like lots of seeds, you don't know quite when it will germinate. Um, but you, you go, you know, with, you go with how it feels for the person, you know, at, at that moment in time. Yeah, I would absolutely second the thing about the options when I'm teaching creative research methods. I always say this to people. Um, but the other thing I think is how you frame it, making it safe. I like to use the phrase, there is no way you can do this wrong. Um, because I think people find that very helpful. There's a sort of, some, for some people, there's a kind of hangover from school when they were in art class and the teacher told them they were doing it wrong and they've internalized that and, you know, or something along those lines. Somebody's told them they're not creative and they've believed it. Actually, everyone's creative 
in, in, in some ways. And we all create our relationships with each other. We don't think about that as creative, but actually it is. In every moment, we're co-creating the relationships that we are in. Um, and I, sometimes I point that out to people as a way, and a, a way of helping them to understand where their own creativity exists. Um, that can be useful. I think this is probably going to be the last question from Sean Hendel, who says, I've seen a number of PhD projects impacted by COVID become quite atomized as the students try to deal with the situation that is thrust upon them. Is there a way in which creative approaches can be used to hold projects together? Wow, that's a nice, simple question to, um, to, 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 to end. Um, wow, that's a, I think that's a great um, question. I, I haven't got a ready-made answer to it because, you know, I, I'm sort of in the fortunate situation with most of my PhD students where they generated their data, um, you know, um, before. Um, it, it feels like a question um, that needs more detail in terms of the p particularities of the case, because I think it's a bit like lots of other things. What are you trying to concatenate? You know, what are you trying to connect? Um, by, you know, generating a creative approach. So, you know, and, and I think, you know, probably the answer is yes, possibly, but it, it depends, which feels very unsatisfactory. Yeah, I mean, we've had, obviously, it's had a massive impact on PhD research plans. And a lot of our students have worked in very creative ways to, to still work with their participants. So I think, it's about letting go sometimes that so you might not be able to do that. And there's a student PhD student who really wanted to do the walk-in interviews because that's what they'd done before. And I said, you can't, you can't design it because you like the method. You know, there's another, I know you really enjoyed it and I'm sure the participants did too, but there's other things that will work. And people have, I mean, I'm amazed by what can be done remotely. So we've had to parcel things out and post them out you could you can like sign making so that's quite low cost equipment wise and people are having um zooms when they've all got the stuff and you could all make the signs together so there are it, it works better than i thought so i think creative methods can give you more options when you feel stuck and i think it's good to try things try things with friends and family try things so for the stage two of the project with children the children are trying things out and it's great because they tell you if it's rubbish they don't care they don't they don't care how long it took you to design or think of something they'll just tell you it's no good so don't be scared to try lots of different things and, and i think one you know 30 second uh, addition to that is i think the key skills that we can teach um uh, phd researchers young researchers are those of adaptation mm. you know we have to adapt our methods to the context. And so when the context changes, we have to adapt you know, to, to, to that context. And that's why COVID has been so interesting um, because we've, discussed, we've discovered lots of things um, aren't possible, um, but you know, lots of things are possible. And I think you know, from my point of view, I've discovered things that I will definitely do post COVID um, that I would have done completely differently you know, before. Mm. This has been so interesting. People, anyone whose questions we haven't dealt with, I'm really sorry, there are loads in the chat, but in the Q&A, but we can't take any more. But we are all active on Twitter. So you can find us there. And if you want to ask, you know, ask us questions, then please do, everybody's nodding. Um, and thank you for coming to this webinar. Thank you so much. We could talk about this all night, really, but uh, I think we've done well. We've covered a range of stuff and thanks so much Dawn and Ali for joining us and for bringing us the benefits of your experience and wisdom. That's been wonderful. And thanks Philippa and Bristol University Press for hosting this webinar. Thanks very much. And, and just to say thank you, uh, thank you for everyone for uh, being so engaged in this discussion. Um, and just a reminder of that, um, the 50% discount uh, code that's available in the chat box and that we'll send out after the event. And just to let you know about our next webinar, which is on the 25th of March on rethinking welfare in the context of COVID-19. So hope to see some of you there. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.